If you need to 
Yeah!
So we are grateful. I said all that to say we're just so grateful that we have the opportunity to come together. And there were several months this year that we really missed seeing each other face to face. And even though we're kind of masked up and and uh, got our shields on a little bit, at least we're together. And we're glad for that. And we are so excited tonight. We're excited this week that after a whole year of not seeing these two face to face, my wonderful in-laws, my wife's parents, Al and Linda Rowan, have uh, come down to South Florida to enjoy this beautiful weather. They have a wonderful family where they are, but we miss them. We were so glad that they were here with us this week. And we can't have Pastor Rowan come down here and we not let him minister as he's been doing for how many years now? About 60. 60 <laughs> years, and I could probably spend the next hour listing all of the things that the Lord has accomplished through his and her ministry. She started evangelizing at 13, and uh, you still praise the Lord. We call her Sister Jesus. <laughs> and uh, it, that's a difficult mother-in-law to live with when you call her Sister Jesus, okay? It's hard to measure up, but uh, uh, just wonderful ministry. They've been such an example to me and, of course, my family. And we had the privilege of working together in ministry in Pittsburgh for several years, and it was a great honor and a blessing. But I think the greatest accomplishment that I can thank you for is raising a wonderful daughter. I thank them. They've raised an awesome daughter. Raised her to love God, raised her to serve the Lord in the church and the ministry, and I have been the beneficiary of that hard work for 26 and some months, 26 <laughs> years and some months. So um, I'm grateful to you. I um, just uh, couldn't be couldn't be happier to have them as my family. And now I'm going to introduce my wonderful father-in-law, Pastor Al Rowan. Yes. None. There are no other gods before you. Yes. There are no 
other powers that be that exist unless you permit them to exist. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be standing here shivering in fear because of what's happening in the world and our own nation. Things that we've never seen happen before. But we're told not to fear. You said do not. I don't know how many times in the word of God, hundreds of times, we see those words do not fear. For the Lord your God is with you. So put a special touch upon the message you have given me to share tonight with those that are here and those watching online. And we ask in Jesus' name that you be glorified in every word and every thought and every deed in the remaining part of this service as you have in the preceding part. And we give you glory for it all. And everybody shout it. Amen. Amen. that you probably all already know. If you don't, you should. But most of us know Romans 8, 28. And, and, and that scripture tells us that all things, everybody say all things. All things. It says all things work together for good to who? And not to everybody. Not to everybody. That's right. But to those who love the Lord and there's no period to those who love the Lord and those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, a lot of people think that they're here for their own purpose. Even Christians, they feel like they don't. We hear so much today about name it, claim it, frame it, and I'm not trying to make fun, fun of anybody, but I'm saying what I'm going to preach tonight, I hope will make you shout, but it won't make all Christians shout. Because some people have not yet discovered what they're supposed to do or what they're supposed to become after they're born again. Amen. I mean, some folks, you know, we hear, like I said, we hear all this ministry, at least I do. Uh, I, I had COVID for three weeks. And you know, when you're as old as I am, you have COVID, you're supposed to be dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm 77 years old. Uh, I have had uh, open heart. Uh, I have coronary heart disease. I'm diabetic. I, I'm a cancer patient, recovering cancer. But I got all those underlying conditions, and I'm still here. Yeah. 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 Somebody asked me when they heard I had COVID. They said, "Well, are you afraid?" I said, "No, I had too much to be afraid of." God brought me through all the rest of it. Hope the world is COVID, but has a ninety-nine point nine percent of
And it says, because God is omniscient, which means all-knowing, that those he foreknew, he knew who was going to get saved because he's omniscient. He knew who was going to accept the calling, uh, his calling, to become a son or daughter of God and come into the family of God. So those that he foreknew, he knew they were going to become his children, he predestined them for something. It said he predestined them to be conformed. Now we know the Bible says we are not to be conformed to this world, but we are to be conformed. And this tells us what and who we are to be conformed to. We are to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. Amen. Now, I want to take just a moment. I've got a few little props here tonight, so bear with me. I'm trying to find a big block of wood. This kind of looks like a big block of wood. And I want you to envision it. You watch it online. They envision a big block of wood. Because I want to talk just, just for a second here about uh, Phipps Festus Born. If you've never heard of him, he was a master wood carver whose carvings, they said, were so excellent that they actually looked like the living object. In other words, they didn't look like a fake uh, duck or a fake uh, bird uh, or a fake figure. They look like the real thing. That's how much of a master wood carver that he was. And here's what he said. I'm going to read his statement right here. It says, carving a duck is quite simple. You just look at a piece of wood. And you get in your mind, in your head, what a duck looks like. And then you just cut off everything that doesn't look like a duck. That's right. Now that does kind of oversimplify things, doesn't it? But here's, I want you to get this in your mind. Here's a block of wood. And Festus Ford would pick up a block of wood this big or larger than this, and then he would envision that is a duck. And he would take out his tools and start carving on that block of wood, and he would knock everything off of that block of wood that did not look like a duck. And you know what would happen is this. This is what would happen. Look how quickly I carved that out. Uh, I'm much more a master than Festus Born. I didn't realize it. But after knocking off everything that doesn't look like a duck, then this duck emerges. And what did it emerge from? A block of wood. And you might say, well, Pastor Allen, what in the world has that got to do with the Word of God or with this service tonight or with me individually? Well, here's what he said. He said, this is the way it is with God. I, I better hold this for another second. I'm getting too, I hope I'm not walking too much and getting out of the camera range. When Brother Coy was here, I, I messaged uh, uh, David, Pastor David, and hey, and I said, tell him he's walking around and, and I can't see him. He's getting out of camera range. <laughs> you know, because we watch everything on YouTube when you replay it. And that way we can kind of stay tuned into the church. But he, he said, God looks at us, so, you know, just kind of envision yourself as a block of wood. That's how God sees us. We're raw material. When we come to him, we're just a block of wood. And so after we come to God, after we're born again, God starts knocking off everything on our block of wood that doesn't look like his son. Amen. Woo. Wow. My Lord. Somebody said, oh, keep on knocking, God. Well, I think I said something to Pastor David this week in the house, and I said, you know, sometimes when I think I'm really making progress, then God will knock something else off. Right. And I said, well, Lord, I didn't even know I had that left, you know. Like, you'd be sitting in a, you ever been sitting in a traffic jam for hours? Yeah. Oh, my, that's when I really know I'm running short on my salvation. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm running short on, on patience. I just and, and, and you know when I know God's really knocking on my block of wood is the day I get up and every traffic light turns red before I get to it. Every stop sign is seem like placed there just for me. And then I get in the traffic to, you know, uh, uh, moving pretty good. And I'm going and making progress and all of a sudden we get that on the way in into Delray coming home 
the Sunshine Parkway. I think they call it the Turnpike now. Years ago when I traveled, it was called the Sunshine Parkway. And the closer we got into large cities, the thicker the traffic. You know, we'd be moving along, moving along, and then we'd start slowing down. And my wife knows because then I start talking. Just talking. It's just me and her in the car. I'm not talking to her. I'm just talking. You know, my life. I said, we may not get there on time, but, but it, it, it just is frustrating sometimes when God is working on you because we think we've already arrived. Amen. You know, we don't say I'm saved and I know that I am. We talk about being blood washed and blood covered and sanctified and, and, and filled with the Holy Spirit, and we are. Amen. But that does not perfect us. Right. See, we, we need to say, Lord, I am not where you want me to be. Because I am not yet completely and totally formed into the image of your son. Amen. I am not conformed. I still got flesh. I still have carnality. I still have, you know, bad thoughts sometimes. You know, even with my wife and I still argue occasionally. I mean, there are other days. I'm just kidding. No, we don't argue that. But we've been married 57 years, and we still sometimes, because we're different. I look at her, and you know, I say to her sometimes, because my wife was born slow. <laughs> now, that's not a, a negative comment. She didn't admit to it. She's kind of slow. I don't mean mentally. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I want to clarify that. I'm not being in big trouble. But, you know, she, she all her life, and getting ready for church or whatever, it takes her a little extra time. And so sometimes, uh, I, I've, uh, I remember a story that we told about our son Michael when he was, I think, in the fifth grade. And we got a call from his teacher saying that, Mr. Ms. Rowan, uh, your son should know every needle on every pine tree outside these windows of our classroom. Because that's all he does in the classroom. He sits looking out the window like he's counting needles on those pine trees. And he was failing his uh, multiplication tables. He was failing this and that and the other. And sometimes, you know, we kind of get caught up in looking out the window. <laughs> and we lose our focus and we forget why we are on planet Earth. And the reason that we are here is to be conformed in the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. The world is not interested in what we say unless we become that. Amen. They're not interested in all the flowery messages we preach and tell them. And they watch our lives and they say, is that person a replica of the God they serve? Is that individual have the attitudes and the characteristics of Jesus Christ? And if we don't, then we need to shut up. Yes. Amen. We don't need to keep talking about Jesus unless we can produce him in our thought life, in our actions, in our attitudes, in our words. And that's why I said, you know, we argue, but we've been married 57 years. We learned how to get through we learned that, that, that while we're arguing sometimes, you know, God is knocking some stuff off of us. That, that we are not conformed in the image of his son. And here's something that, that I want to say, and I want to kind of switch gears here and bring you uh, these other thoughts and then in here. Here's what uh, Mr. Bourne said. He said the first thing that we've got to do is realize that God looks at us as rough blocks of wood and envisions in us the Christ-like man or woman hidden beneath those bark and knots and ugly-looking piece of wood that he started with, he envisions that. And he said, so uh, when, when he begins to carve away everything that does not fit the image of his son, we would be amazed to see how beautiful we are as finished sons and daughters of God. Now, Festus Ford said we'd be amazed to see how beautiful we are as finished ducks. But I don't think anybody in here wants to be a quacker, right? You're not, your, your aim is not to be a duck, but we are aiming to be sons and daughters of God. And so we should be willing to say, Lord, I know it is painful when you begin to carve me up. I know it doesn't feel good when you get out the knife and the tools and the chisel and the rough, rough sandpaper. Because even after you get all that cutting and carving done, there are still rough places on that unfinished product. 
We're still not totally conformed to the image that God wants us to be conformed to. And that is the image of Jesus Christ. And, and he said sometimes the process is wonderful. But sometimes the process is painful. But in the end, all of God's tools conform us to the image of his son. And my question to you tonight is, if you will mind, do you long, do you linger, do you have a passion to be conformed into the image of the Son of God? Yes. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. I want to be conformed. I want to be like Jesus. Yes. I've had people tell me, well, you, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> and I said, it's not in me trying. It's in me submitting. Right. It's in me submitting to the Holy Spirit. Every one of us who are born again and spirit-filled have uh, resident within us Amen. one of the triune God in called the Holy Spirit. He lives in me. Amen. He lives in my sister and her husband. He lives, and if you're a professing a Christian or believer, a spirit-filled believer, in here or online, you have a resident within you, the Holy Spirit himself. Yes. And he said, when I come, I'm going to lead you and guide you into all truth. Not all not some of the truth, but all of the truth. And the only way we can find all of the truth, and actually when, when, when Jesus was asked or the question, what is truth? What is truth? He, he simply said, I am the truth. Amen. I am the way and I am the life. So you don't have to look in books to find the truth unless it's the word of God. Because you have the truth resident within you. He said, when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will lead us and guide us into all truth. He knows the truth. Yes. Because Jesus is the truth. Yes. And so the Holy Spirit is constantly introducing us to the truth, which is Jesus Christ. We can only be godly if we submit. You cannot be godly by trying hard. You can't be godly by fasting and praying. Somebody said, well, what, how am I going to be godly? By submitting. To the Holy Spirit, He's the only one who knows how to be like God. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to be like God. I don't. I'm carnal. I'm fleshly. I'm selfish. I'm a lot of things. I don't know how to be like God in myself. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, He knows how to act like Himself. Yes. He knows how to act like God because He is a part of the Holy Trinity. So He comes in and He's God in us. Amen. The Apostle Paul said, the hope of glory. Yes. Woo, hallelujah. It, it's just thrilling to think about it. Now I want to move on to, to something here. Uh, you might wonder how they connect, but I think you'll, you'll see in a moment. Uh, there is a scripture. I was going to jot it down, but uh, I believe it's in the Psalms. I believe it's in the 138th Psalm, where the psalmist said, Do not abandon the works of your hand. I get back and think about that block of wood and how unsightly and ungainly it may look when you first got saved. And you know, even after that, I would say a long time, I was saved in 1958 at a youth camp in Macon, Georgia. Uh, I was running from God. My parents had come to God uh, a couple years prior to that. They had been what I call social Christians. They had belonged to a uh, uh, big Methodist church in our hometown, a very small hometown. I came from a little town of about 1,800 people, uh, 20 miles south of Atlanta. And back in 1957, 56, 58, when I was growing up, everybody knew everybody. You know, it was the county seat, the courthouse was there. And my dad, he ran a business called Bama's Drugstore. Bama, because he was from Alabama. He, he was so much from Alabama, a football fan, and an Alabama fan, and he named my half brother Bama. <laughs> I have a brother named Bama, Joseph's brother. Uh, and he's with the Lord now. But he became a Baptist missionary. He went to Kenya, Africa, and preached. But I'm saying that uh, to, to become like the person God wants us to be requires submission. Amen. You know, that's a nasty word, almost anybody. But we don't want to submit to anybody. We want to be our. Right. We do. Mm -hmm. When we get saved and married, <laughs> that's being saved too, I guess, and when you get married and stay, you're going to get 
saved. You don't get saved to lose your mind. So uh, why not wait and lose your mind and get the mind of Christ and stay married? Yes, sir. Uh, and, and, and listen, if you're not married and gone through divorce, I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to be negative about your situation. I'm just saying that whatever you've done, God can take that wood and put it back in the hands of God, take out the tools again, and start carving on you again until he's carving you into the image of his son. Amen. Now, I want to, to make this point because I don't think that we really know how to pray until the Holy Spirit is in control of us. Right. We, don't, uh, we may know how to read prayers out of a book. Uh, we may know how to say now I don't sleep to that type of prayer. But we don't really know how to pray and how to connect to God unless the Holy Spirit is praying through us and in us. And Paul taught that. He said, I know what it is to pray in, in the understanding. I know what it is to pray in the Spirit. Uh, so we need the Holy Spirit to pray when we don't know what to pray for. When we're all prayed out and our language is exhausted and we don't know anything else to say in our native tongue, then the Holy Spirit can start to pray through us. He said, in Romans, which cannot be uttered, and he can pray to us, us right into the presence of God. Hallelujah. Two very important thoughts about prayer that I wanted to weave into this message uh, right now. And that is praying God's word and praying God's will. Uh, I hear a lot about praying God's word. People will get the Bible down and they will start praying scripture. I don't find anything wrong with that. But we need to, before we pray God's word, we need to find out his will. Right. Then we'll know what kind of word to pray. We'll know what kind of scriptures to insert. Uh, and, and then we can become, uh, you might say, aligned with the word of God when we're praying. And then we'll be praying in God's will. So praying God's word and praying God's will is key in the life of every believer. The written word never, ever contradicts the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's right. And the Holy Spirit never, ever contradicts the written word. That's right. The Bible said the Spirit and the word must agree. They must come together. Now, I've had some say to me through the years, well, Pastor Al, I don't care really what you say that the Word says because I, I know the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a stupid say. Yeah. You know, but people have said that. And they told me through the years, I, you know, I'm hearing from God. And I said, well, the Word said, well, I don't know you say the Word says that, but I'm hearing the voice of God. I said, no, you're not. Well, they said, it aligns itself with God's Word. You're hearing a voice, but it's not God's voice. Don't you understand? You believe us watching online for those of you here that God is not the only power operating in the supernatural realm. That's right. There are demons and, and there are demonic spirits that are also operating and they all try to mimic God. Yeah. They don't come out just like Lucifer with a pointed tail and horns and a pitchfork. That's not how they look. They come out as angels. They come out as messengers of God. They want to deceive you. And, and, and when Jesus was asked a question by his disciples in Matthew 24 and other places, they said, Lord, how shall we and when shall we know what's going to be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And are the end of the age? The world will never end, but the age will end. When, when will we know that the end of the age is coming? The very first thing he said was, take heed that no man, no man deceive. We always call out, no, men are deceiving us today. Some of them call themselves politicians. Some call themselves preachers. Some of them call themselves friends. Right. Mm. But we can be deceived by friends if we don't have the Holy Ghost and have Him really tuned up in our life. Because I see thousands of people following after false prophets today, and if you told them they were following a false prophet, they would hate you and not the false prophet. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. They would hate you for saying that that false prophet was false. And that's the Bible. The Bible says in the last days they're going to say, prophesy to us something that makes us feel good. Right. Even if it's a lie, prophesy this is the Bible. Prophesy lies to us if it makes us feel good. And, and that's what people want to do. They want to feel good. That's right. They want to go ahead and have that. Many years ago, when we were still pastoring in Pennsylvania, and he 
said, you know something, Pastor? He said, for the last three or four weeks, I've been leaving the church feeling worse than when I can. And he said, I think you need to really seek God about what you're preaching. <laughs> he was one of my board members. <laughs> he was important. I loved it. Still do. We're still good friends. But I said to him, brother, I called the thing of brother. He said, I just feel like you're preaching condemnation. And I said, are, are, are you sure that you're not confusing the word conviction right. with condemnation. Right. I said condemnation comes from the devil because the Bible says there is therefore right now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. It says who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If you're still a flesh walker and a flesh talker, you can be condemned. The enemy will condemn you. You walk around with guilt all the time. But if you realize who you are as a child of God, there's no condemnation, but there's conviction. The Holy Ghost will convict you of the way you're talking. The Holy Ghost will convict you of the way you're thinking. The Holy Ghost will convict you of the way that you're living and tell you you need to move up. I want to conform you some more in the image of my son. I want to knock off some more of those rough edges so you can be conformed in the image. One fellow, uh, well, well, when this guy told me he didn't care what the words, words said because he knew the voice of God, I said, you know, brother, the first and primary way the Holy Spirit guides God's children, through his word. That's right. Through his word. And uh, John 17, 17, he said, he, the Holy Spirit, will guide you into all truth. I mentioned that earlier. The truth is the word of God. One man told me he prayed for guidance and all he got was scripture. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? He said, that, that's why I've been praying for guidance but all I, I, I just keep getting, getting, getting scripture. I said, well, that's the way the Holy Ghost guides believers. He does it with his word. You're going to keep getting scripture, I hope, because that way you'll know it's God's voice and not a satanic voice or a deceptive voice or your own voice. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit. He's, he's, he's giving you that guidance. The longest psalm in the Bible, Psalm 119, verse 105, says, Your word, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Hmm? You know, now we say, if you wanted to walk out at night and spit start, you get a flashlight. You don't even get a lamp these days. You get a flashlight, a good one, you know, one of these special ones they advertise on. TV all the time, drugs get run over and everything else, you know. Uh, I'm not interested in that, I like to light. When I go out in the dark. And you get that flashlight and you start walking in with that light. It's a lamp under your feet. It shows you the right steps to take. It shows you the right path to take. So we need to understand that God's word is a lamp and a light to our path. John 16, 13 says when he, the spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, when he, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority. Hmm. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will show you things to come that's pertaining to the new government. And he said, and let me just insert this, the Holy Trinity never contradicts one another. That's right. Amen. Yes. Deuteronomy 6, 4, it said, the Lord our God is one. So the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict God the Father. God the Father doesn't contradict God the Son. They are all in agreement. They move Together. They have one thought, they have one mind, they have one purpose, and that is to conform you and I, sons and daughters of God, into the holy image of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Make sure we shout and say, Lord, help me! Yes. Conform me! But you're going to carve some more on me. It hurts sometimes. Yeah. I'm telling you, I've had so many life threatening surgeries. I went for my, the first 40 years of my life where I ever had a head. I mean, I hardly was ever sick. And all of a sudden, uh, when I was around 42, I think it was, somewhere around there, uh, I went to the doctor for my physical, and he said, I, your, your blood sugar is high, and they diagnosed me as a diabetic, and then uh, ended up on all kinds of meds, you know how they do, and insulin and everything else. And then the next thing I know, a few, few months after that, I'm diagnosed with this tumor in my back, 
And they said, we got to go in and find out uh, with, with it's, where it's located. We can't really find out till we get in there. And uh, so they, they removed the tumor. It was benign. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a surgery where, well, I have, I have a, a spot right here, about six inch circle in my right hip that has been numb ever since that surgery. That's been years and years ago. Good place, though, to give me my injections for diabetes. <laughs> That's why I pop around in there, brother. Chris, I don't feel the way. Amen. But, but you're trying to get the, the good out. Yeah. You find some good. But then, you know, all, uh, along came open heart surgery. And they said, well, you know, well, we got one bypass, and there's a little part already in there uh, that we don't know what it's there for. I said, well, I guess God put it there for the surgery I'm about to have. Because they said, we can take that, and then you don't have to have a pig valve or this and that other. That's in and, and they did that. And I came to the open heart surgery, and then uh, I became a, a, a cancer patient. Uh, I have had five, I think it is, melanoma surgeries. I've had the uh, uh, portion of my middle of my right lung removed. Uh, after that, got all done. I, I'm thinking I'm coming out of recovery. Took me uh, a good what three months almost to get through that lung surgery. I recuperated from open heart surgery quicker than I did lung surgery. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to get through it. I think I'm going back for my follow-up appointment to the doctor. And uh, she comes in and she says, well, I, I've got some bad news for you. And I thought, oh, Lord, that's all these people ever give me. <laughs> and uh, so she said, uh, even though uh, we, we've been able to treat and remove that portion that was contaminated in your lung, uh, now you have a a large tumor the size of a baseball or a man's fist in your chest cavity. Oh. And they said, so now we got to treat that. So I go through all the Renee actually called me from down here. We were in Texas. Uh, we were uh, planning two new churches. We were out there for a couple of years. She said, Dad, I've been seeing on television down here in Texas where they have this new cyber knife radiation. Maybe you should look into it. So I called my doctors there in Texas, and they said, yes, we have two of those machines right here. So I went and I, I conferred with the doctors. They put me on uh, five treatments of the uh, radiation side of life, and they burst uh, that tumor in my chest. And so they told me after the treatment, they said, well, now we'll take care of that. Uh, and they showed me x-rays and all those pieces and tidbits. That's where we blast it. It's not a big fist now. It's just all fragments, and they're all dead. So you don't have to worry about it. Uh, you know, your body will just absorb it, and we all know oh, that's great. And so I wait a little while, and I go back for a follow-up. They come going to get cleared. And they said, we have found a spot on your liver. I said, my oh, Lord. Uh, I said, well, can we clean that along? No, we've got to give you cyber knife radiation for that. And so we went through, uh, I think, five of those cyber knife radiation. And then, uh, when I came off of all that, they wanted to give me chemo, and I said, no chemo, no chemo for me, no. And uh, <laughs> so, I just didn't believe in the chemo part. And they said, well, we have some uh, immunotherapy, and we can put that in your body. So they pumped all that. They gave me a 90-minute, but the, the first treatment was 90 minutes. They infused it, and then I went back for another half-hour treatment. And then, before I could get back for my next appointment, I broke out from my neck uh, down to my ankles with these big welts. Looked like you'd been burned all over. And they told me that might happen, but probably wouldn't because it was very seldom that it happened. <laughs> Thank you, God. Uh, that's what I mean. You know, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, why am I the one? Why am I the one? And that's very few that, that get this reaction. And I don't know what I learned to say through all this. Why not me? Am I special? Mm. You know what the answer to that is? I'm special. That's right. And so are you. Mm -hmm. Because we're God's children. Amen. The Lord was carving on me. I don't always like it. I'll tell you that. I didn't say you always like it. Mm. But if you learn to submit to it, you will be the victor. Mm -hmm. I walk closer to God right now than I've ever walked in all the years of my life. And I'm thankful for it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thankful. Yes. I, I look back at all these things and I don't ever say, you know what, Lord, I'm so angry with you. I have people tell me this. I don't relate to this. 
They said, have you ever been angry at God? I said, no, not one time. Not one time. I have not always understood God. There have been times I have said, why? And if you say why, you're not trusting. Because the word trust means unquestioning belief. That's right. Wow. How many times have we sung, tis so sweet mm -hmm. to trust in Jesus? Why, Lord? Why did you? We're not really trusting because we're asking why all the time. Uh, when you start saying, Lord, not my will, yeah. does that sound familiar? Yeah. Who said that? Jesus. Jesus himself, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. And before that, his own uh, earthly nature cried out to his father and said, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. I do not want to drink it. But he ended that prayer by totally submitting to his father and saying, nevertheless, it's not what I want. It's what you want. How can I glorify you to the greatest extent? And God put that cross right in front of his son and said, this is the way. And this is the only way that you're going to bring all of those who are severed from us because of sin. There's only one way to bring them all back. And that's you've got to go to the cross. You've got to be rejected. You've got to be scorned. You've got to be hated. You've got to go through all these things. You're my son, and I love you. But there's going to come a day I'm going to turn my back on you. Because of all the sin of the world is going to be put on you. It's going to be put on you. My whole point of saying all that is submission. I want you to, I want you to leave here tonight and hear this message on the internet and we with this thought that submission to God is what I'm aiming for. A hundred percent submission to that Holy Spirit that resides in me and lives with me. Have, have I got there yet? Ask my wife. <laughs> uh, she'll tell you the truth. And then I'll tell you the truth as far as I know see, because I don't think like her and she doesn't think like me. So when I might say to her, well, don't you think I'm doing a lot better uh, in this area? <laughs> she, she doesn't always agree with me. You know, sometimes she says, yeah. she don't even sometimes say I'm doing better. She just looks at me. <laughs> well, that's the same look she got on the face of the <laughs> kind of smiles, you know, as if to say, yeah, you know, you can work a little harder. You can work a little harder there. And, and I want to, I want to. Uh, let, let me get to this. I hope I'm not going too long. My grandson has given me strict orders on how long I can preach and how long I can stand. So I'm, I'm going to try not to keep it too late. Uh, how many have ever been asked the question, is it always God's will to heal? Yeah. I think that over just a second because I'm going to answer it for you. Is it always God's will to physically heal? I'm going to answer that with a yes, but with a big if. Yes, if. If what, Pastor? Yes, it's always God's will to physically heal if you recognize death as the ultimate healing. It's, I don't know, that I, I'm going to be healed, I'm going to die. You're going to die. Yep. Just it's a victory. put that in your pipe and smoke it as though they used to say, well, I'm going to die. You're going to die. It is appointed unto man that wants to die. So we're going to die if we live long enough, or we're going to be raptured. That's right. Did you know that even if you're raptured, you die? You go through what we would call metamorphosis. It said you shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, but you've got to be changed because this body is mortal. So it has to put on immortality. It has to die. So it'll go through that. And my brother, who's with the Lord, he, he would call me many days. And he'd say, well, it could happen today because he wanted to be raptured so bad. He was 90 years old when he did pass on. But he'd call me and say, hey, you know what? He called me Junior. He'd say, Junior, it could happen any day. And I'd say, yes, it could. 
He said, don't you want to go? I said, I ain't going. <laughs> he was a Baptist, so he thought there was no way he could miss it. I'm just teasing really bad at church. Lord, don't come straight. But if you recognize death as a home, let me give you this scripture. I'm hurrying there. No, no, no. First Corinthians 15 26 says this The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Right. So it is an enemy. It is. Death is my enemy. It's your enemy. It was the enemy of, of Jesus. But he conquered it in it. And so when we, how did Jesus conquer that? He went through it. <laughs> and came out resurrected. And if we die, it will be the ultimate healing because then the body we come out of the grave with or are raptured with is going to be an immortal, uncorrupted body. The Bible said corruption shall put on incorruption, and mortal shall put on immortality, Amen. and death will be swallowed up in victory. Amen. See, that's, that's what you shout right there, yes. that death is our enemy, but believers in Christ, and I'm going to try to end right here with this, this thought, believers in Christ should live with eternity in mind. Amen. Not with it. Everybody, everybody remember E.B. Hill, Dr. E.B. Hill, he used to preach on TV at all the time. He was one of Paul Crouch's uh, favorite preachers. Uh, pastor in Los Angeles for years. And Dr. E.B. Hill said, you should write temporary on everything you own, right. including right. your body. Right. Your house, your automobiles, your, your bank accounts, your wealth. And when you look in the mirror, you write temporary right across your head. Because this body you're living in is temporary. Right. It's all temporary. Everything we see and touch is temporary. What we don't see in church is eternal. Amen. That's right. That don't make everybody shout, but don't make us shout. That's right. You know, I mean, we, we're the people of God called by his name. Praise and God. once you get this in your in your mind, it frees you. Yes. Amen. It frees you. I'm not afraid to die. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I was, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily afraid, but I never thought about it much. You know, when you're healthy. And everything's cruising along. You don't think about dying. You think about living. Right. But then when you get diagnosed with all these life-threatening diseases, and actually they come out and tell you, what you have here is probably going to kill you. They didn't use those words. But they said, what you have with this melanoma, even if we surgically remove it, it is going to come back. And we'll surgically remove it if we can, if it really comes back. But hey, Pastor, it's going to keep coming back. And it did five times. So I said, what are you going to do if it comes back now? Same thing I did when it came back the other five times. I'm going to trust God. Amen. I remember saying when I was growing up, I trust in God. I know He cares for me. All mountains believe. All on the stormy sea. Though pillows Way to live, a new body to live, and nobody can kill it, and disease cannot contain.
because he's bringing about his purpose in multiple situations. God's purpose is not to save our temporary dying bodies. It's not his purpose. It's to save our eternal souls. You remember Gail Dixon, honey? Gail's daddy was an alcoholic, and he'd get saved every so many months. He'd get saved, and then he'd get drunk as a skunk again, and he'd go back out, and he would carouse. Uh, Gail's mom and Gail came to my wife and said, pray, I, I was talking about Stevens, I don't remember his first name, pray that he will come to God and stay with God no matter what. And when they came and asked me to pray, I said, are you sure you want to pray that prayer? They said, oh yeah, we want him saved no matter what. And God saved him and he died. Mm -hmm. Never got drunk again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he couldn't. He didn't have nobody to get drunk. Because God answered that prayer. They said, we want him saved no matter what. God, omniscient, saw the future and said, this man is not going to stay faithful to me. So the next time he makes a choice to come to me, I'm going to receive him and then I'm going to take him on home. Amen. God knows best. So don't question God when he moves the way that he moves. And my last and final thought is this. I am wrapping up. This is the last wrap. Put the bow on wrap. And I watch it carefully there. Uh, Johnny Erickson Todd. Anybody ever read a book? It's a hard movie. Totally healthy teenage girl had a dying accident, became a paraplegic for the rest of her life. How we met Johnny, she came to Albuquerque, Pennsylvania, a beautiful person. Uh, so many handicapped people attended that meeting. They sitting all around the front looking at her like little birds, looking at all of her. Why? Because they knew she felt what they felt. She understood what they were going through. And the Bible says that Jesus is touched with the feeling of our infirmities and has compassion on us. See, we can have sympathy, but he has empathy. He feels what we feel. So whenever you think to yourself, the enemy says nobody knows how to feel. So yes, there's one. There's one who knows how I feel. He actually feels with me. And he's my mediator, he's my intercessor. And I give everything I can carry to him. Yes. Because he told me to cast all your cares upon me. I care about you. Amen. You understand that, don't you, Tina? Mm -hmm. You and Chris, you went through some rocky times. And now you're asking counseling other people mm -hmm. of how to get through. Because God brought you through. Yes. That's how we grow. Yeah, you don't grow by saying, Lord, I don't want to go through that. I'm going to face that. I'm not. Just heal me and get me out of the sickness. Mm -hmm. I start praying all the time. I, I pray Jesus' prayer. And I've had some Pentecostal friends of mine tell me, you pray that prayer, I'll be praying unbelief. I said, leave me alone, because that's the way I'm going to be praying. Mm -hmm. I said, if my, if my Savior and my Lord and my Master could pray, if it be your will, I can pray it too. Right. I can pray it too, because I trust my father, Amen. who knows better than I do. And when I don't know what he's doing, he knows what he's doing. Amen. And the Holy Spirit in me knows what he's doing because they're all three one, they're all three connected. So if somebody's lingering in an illness, bringing about uh, you know, multiple uh, purposes of God, uh, God is in the end, like Johnny Erickson Tyler, I heard Johnny say personally, she said, I wouldn't be in this wheelchair knowing God would be standing on both my feet without it. That's right. Now, that's after she's been a paraplegic for 45, 50 years. Because mm -hmm. Johnny's getting a little bit close to our age now. Maybe older, I don't know exactly. But she's never been healed. She said, friends come and got me, took me to a healing meeting. And she said, I believe and I read all the healing scriptures. I told them to anoint me with oil. They anoint me with oil in the name of the Lord. And she said, I pick up my leg and try. I tried to get up out of that wheelchair. She said, but I couldn't do it. It, it, I just couldn't do it within myself. No, she needed a miracle. And God didn't give her a miracle. 
She said, but I would have not ministered to millions of people right. if I had been standing on my two feet. But because I paraplegic, God is using me the way that I am. Many of you have heard David Wayne, the evangelist for muscular dystrophy, mm -hmm. who did something that says, uh, I, my problem is muscular dystrophy. Dystrophy. You know, yeah. He says, what's your problem? No, we all, all got a problem. And mine happens to be muscular dystrophy, but he goes ahead and preaches anyway. Mm -hmm. And then they voice it. Born with no arms, no legs. Uh, we had a, one of our friends, uh, Rachel, out in Texas, who went to his meeting, and they couldn't get in. After they got there, there was no seats. So they waited out in the lobby and watched on the screen for the whole service to take place. And happened to see him when they took him off stage and were taking him to the elevator. And they were standing there and they got up off of the seats where they'd been watching on the screen. And Nick looked back at them and they got in the elevator and the elevator started going up. And they were standing there so well, you know, they wanted to speak to him, they wanted to talk to him, now he's gone. She said, so we looked back and the elevator had come back down and opened up. And Nick came out and said, I feel like you ladies wanted a hug. <laughs> the guy with no arms and no legs had enough spiritual sensitivity in the Holy Ghost to say, after they were taking him on, take me back down. I just saw two ladies as we got on the elevator, and I feel like they need a hug. <laughs> she said, Pastor Al, I never met a more loving person in all my life. What a beautiful smile. And if you've ever seen him speak, even if it's on, on television, uh, and if you haven't, you need to dial him in and listen to him speak sometime. You'll find out a beautiful spirit. And yet he was born and severely handicapped. But he's accepted where he is. And just like Johnny says, there'll be a day I'll run and jump and, and dance and shout on the streets of glory. And I'm willing to wait my chance, my turn. And so does David Rand. And so does people like Dave Gorsuch. Helen Keller. I mean, the list is long. The list is long uh, of people who've had to go through a lot of things. So when you read the Word of God, and you read Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says that God has set eternity in our hearts. And every human soul is a God-given awareness that there is something more than this transient world. Even the Buddhists know it. Even those that follow false gods, what, they always got nirvana, they got this, they think there's something out there because God is the eternity in the soul of every human being. And the Hebrew word for eternity is olam, O-L-A-M, olam. And it carries the sense that we have a divinely implanted awareness that the soul lives forever, forever. This world is not my home. Everybody stand This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Amen, amen. The angels begging me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Amen. Oh, Lord, you know. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? Angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I can't feel at home. I don't even call the house that we live home. I call it our house. Now you need to remember that because you don't have a home down here. You might think you do. You got a house, but your home is up there. The Bible says we are not citizens of this world. We are citizens of heaven. Amen. And our home, our mansion. Got one now, and maybe you do, according to world standards. But you got one up there where eye has not seen and ear has not heard. It's never entered the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love Him. Now I'm going to pray for you before Pastor David comes, uh, or Renee, or who's coming. <laughs> and uh, I, I want to pray for you though, because I feel like, and, and those watching online, uh, let me encourage you that watch them online. If you don't support this ministry financially, you should, especially if this ministry is feeding you. And I'm not going to receive an offer. Don't worry about it. I could, there's nothing wrong with it. God's all for it. But I, 
I want you to know that if you come, and, and those watching uh, over the internet who are uh, within driving distance of this great fellowship, you know, see, a lot of times people don't want to be a part of something when it's just being formed. Because it's, it's going to go through growing pains and forming pains, and just like a baby. When, when someone is pregnant, that baby, it, it don't pop out of there immediately. It goes through a lot. And you hear the mom say, I feel something moving down there. Dad, feel right there. Look here, there's a foot, there's a head coming out. And that's what happens when we build a church. It, it don't just happen. But see, those of you who are kind of staying away now for whatever reason, when the church is running a thousand, you'll be happy to jump in and in. Now somebody said, well, how are you going to go run a thousand? Why not? Got the best worship leader in the world. Got the best pastor. Uh, you got a, a good seated congregation already started. Why wouldn't God add to it? Amen. He will because He's a faithful God. Yes. So don't don't be weary in, in doing well Amen. because the, the word said you shall reap in due season. What you if you faint. don't faint? If you don't give up. Now I, if you talk to to David today, I haven't talked to him about it. But uh, I think there's probably been thoughts run through their mind. You know what in the world? Huh? Things don't happen. If this don't break, if this don't happen, what are we going to do? That's the natural. That's what we think. That's right. And that's why I said earlier, you know, you've got to replace, practice thought replacement mm -hmm. and put the word in your mind. Yes. And then you'll be a conqueror. That's right. Anybody in here, before I pray, anybody in this one, lift your hand. And by lifting your hand, say, Pastor Al, I've heard everything you've said tonight, and I do believe that I want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, no matter what it costs me, no matter how much I hurt. Now, if you don't mean it, don't raise your hand. But if you mean it, raise your hand. I want to pray for you. You that are online, I want to pray for you. If you want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. See, some people are afraid to raise their hand because it's not easy. It's not easy. My daddy was a businessman. I'm going to pray right here. He was a businessman. And when he got saved, he never closed his business on a Sunday in his life. It was his biggest money-making day because we were the only person out of the town. It was over. So everybody came to my dad's family's uh, on, on Sunday. And God dealt with him about closing his business. And we lived up over our business, and the back part was our home. And my mother told the story. Now, I was still at home then. I was 12 years old when they came to Christ. I wasn't a Christian for three more years. Uh, I fought it. I fought them. I thought they were lunatics when they really got saved. You know, because they, back then, all the Pentecostals were leaving us. Okay. Let me see here. Yeah, you couldn't have wore that ring back in those days. You couldn't have wore all that jewelry. You know, all the fancy jewelry. Even, even you got some jewelry on, so you'd have been on that. <laughs> now, I said, listen, we raised that way, we don't know we that way. And that was, it was never said, it was legalism. But we, we didn't preach that, we didn't say that. Now we know that. Now, that doesn't mean we're going out here and set up a storm, we don't do that. Actually, we serve God. But I want you to pray with me right now. Right now, everybody here, Father. I thank you for the privilege, the invitation to come here and speak to these people and those online as well. Your word, your word, I love it. Lord, there's nothing like your word. And when the Holy Spirit in us starts revealing your word, it's a beautiful thing. It gives us stature. It gives us maturity. And we can begin to help other people and not always be concentrating on what we need. We can reach out and help others in need. Because that's why you put us here. To be like your son. And your son was always doing good. Always. Even to those that abused him, misused him, he didn't return that to them. He returned love. He returned goodness. He returned forgiveness. He returned restoration. And I pray that those that had their hands raised, even on the internet and online, Facebook and YouTube, if you're raising your hand right now, as we pray. Just say, Lord, I want to learn submission. I want to learn submission to the cross. I know the cross speaks death to flesh. The cross speaks death to myself. But the cross, when the flesh dies, 
that the Spirit lives in power and great glory. And I ask you to answer the prayer of these people that lifted their hand. And may they live the greatest life of Christ they've ever lived. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's welcome the Pastor David back. And then he's going to take it. Praise the Lord. That was a wonderful reminder. You know, uh, as I was thinking about all that, it's just as a matter of we got to be pliable. You know, we, we can't resist it. And if we're stubborn in life, we're probably stubborn with the Lord. So we've got to get to the point where he doesn't have to take the rod and just keep beating us. I'd rather be moldable clay then be chiseled like a hard piece of wood. Amen? Amen. Can we just commit to just say, Lord, I want to be in your image. It's a beautiful image. We look full on his glorious face. And why wouldn't we want to be like him? Amen. Don't rebel. Don't push against it. Don't resist it. But submit. And that was a wonderful word. Good reminder to us. And thank you for sharing your testimony about how the Lord has been faithful to you through the trials and the situations you've been through because that gives us hope. Amen. When we're, we don't know what we're going to face, right? right? But when we face it, we know if the Lord did it for Brother Al, <laughs> he's going to do it for me <laughs> too. Anybody. <laughs> anybody. If he can work through this guy, I know he can work through anybody. No, I'm just teasing. So God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight. And those of you